Members of the Australian Accounting Hall of Fame, 2022 Australian Accounting Hall of Fame inductees and representatives, esteemed guests, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the 13th Annual Australian Accounting Hall of Fame Awards. My name's Brad Potter. I'm an Associate Professor and Head of the Department of Accounting at the University of Melbourne. Firstly, I'd like to acknowledge that our campus is located on the lands of the Wurundjeri people who have been custodians of this land for thousands of years. We acknowledge and pay our respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. I extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples watching today. The Australian Accounting Hall of Fame was established in 2010 and aims to recognise and champion those Australians who have made or are making a significant contribution to accounting. At present, the Hall boasts 38 inductees, all pioneers of the profession. Tonight, we welcome two more illustrious accountants into the fold. The Australian Accounting Hall of Fame is an integral part of the University of Melbourne's desire to engage with the town. The Hall of Fame is an important occasion for the department and faculty to continue to develop and bolster our strong relationships with the broader accounting business community including the accounting profession, professional associations, industry, government, standard setters and regulators. I'd like to extend a particular thanks to our major sponsors, CPA Australia and Chartered Accountants Australia and New Zealand, whose support augments and enriches the Hall of Fame each year. Due to the ongoing complications caused by the COVID-19 pandemic, we present for the second year in a row the Hall of Fame Presentation Gala in virtual format. I thank you for tuning in and congratulate the 2022 inductees. The 2022 commemorative booklet will be available for download from our website. Please see the link in this video's description to access the booklet. I now hand over to the Director of the Australian Accounting Hall of Fame, Dr Phil Cobbin, to introduce this year's Colin Ferguson Orator. Thank you, Brad, for the introduction. The Colin Ferguson oration, commemorating the instrumental role played by Professor Colin Ferguson in establishing the Australian Accounting Hall of Fame, is this evening presented by Mr Bill Edge. Bill Edge was first appointed as a member of the Australian Auditing Standards Board in 2001. Between 2004 and 2007, he served as chair. Bill's time as AUASB chair coincided with the period when auditing standards were first recognised as legal instruments under the Corporations Act in 2005. And the standards became a fully funded agency of the Commonwealth Government pursuant to CLRP 9 reforms. In addition to his governance role, Bill was responsible for establishing the strategic direction for the board, leading the production of high quality financial statement auditing standards and guidance, including the associated consultation processes with key stakeholders. Thought leadership by Australia in assurance over a broader range of non-financial information and contributing to international standard setting through submissions on proposed standards and attendance at international forums. In 2014, his focus shifted to regulatory oversight when he was appointed Chair of the Financial Reporting Council. As FRC Chair, Bill's responsibilities included provision of strategic advice to the Minister, currently the Assistant Treasurer, on matters relevant to the financial reporting system, ensuring the FRC met its statutory and strategic responsibilities, internationally benchmarking FRC strategy and operations with comparable organisations, liaising with stakeholders such as the business community, users of financial reports, accounting professional bodies and regulators within Australia. Ensuring the country is adequately represented on international standard setting bodies and that Australia is an active contributor to international standard setting and overseeing the performance of the Australian Accounting Standards Board and the Australian Auditing Standards Board. As an indication of his leadership, Bill was reappointed to the FRC as chair for a second three-year term in 2019. 
In recognising the importance of supporting high quality financial reporting during the COVID-19 pandemic, Bill established the FRC COVID-19 Working Group, comprising senior representatives from the standard setting and regulatory bodies. The role of the Working Group is to continuously monitor financial reporting and auditing issues and consequent regulatory and standard setting implications of COVID-19. This working group works to ensure appropriate guidance is issued to preparers of aud and auditors of financial reports, which would hopefully be instrumental in facilitating informed capital markets in a time of extreme uncertainty. Bill Edge stood down as chair of the FRC on 31 December 2020 to take up a position as the acting chair of the AU ASB. He remained a member of the FRC. His present term on the FRC concludes in July 2022. Bill Edge's professional career with PricewaterhouseCoopers started in 1974 in the Audit Division as a graduate. A decade in academia preceded his admission to the partnership in 1996. He was subsequently elected senior partner and assumed leadership of the firm's professional standards group and later the risk and quality group. In these latter roles, he oversaw a range of reforms that had a major impact on how the firm operated. For four years before retiring as a partner in 2014, Bill Edge was PwC's Asia Pacific Risk and Quality Leader. Bill Edge was inducted into the Australian Accounting Hall of Fame in 2021. I look forward to hearing what Bill Edge has to say to us accountants from his position as a standard setter and a regulator. Guests, it is my privilege to introduce to you Australian Accounting Hall of Fame alumnus Bill Edge to deliver the 2022 Colin Ferguson oration. Good evening. I knew Colin Ferguson and I consider him a, an extremely competent professional. I admired particularly the way he tried to bring industry and academia together. And that same objective, which is held by the Centre for Accounting and Industry Partnerships, I also applaud. So I am very honoured to present the Colin Ferguson oration tonight. My background, I was a partner with PwC for 18 years. I have experience as a standard setter. I'm currently chair of the Auditing and Assurance Standards Board, and I have just been appointed to the International Auditing and Assurance Standards Board. I've been involved in financial system oversight by virtue of being chair of the Financial Reporting Council, and I serve on the equivalent body in New Zealand, the XRB, and I was an academic for many years. So I've interacted with accountants in many positions and that's the experience I bring tonight and I expect there'll be many people in the audience from a variety of backgrounds as well. Having said that, as I speak tonight, I will go over some background information and, and just so that there's no, no confusion as to what I'm referring to. Similarly, I may use acronyms, which are in, a part of our profession, but I will try and explain them all. What I'd like to talk about tonight is uh, some recent developments in annual reporting, and in particular, what I'll call sustainability reporting, that, that may have a significant effect on the accounting profession in Australia. I say may, because it's very important that there be compromise and that it be carried out on a time, in a timely manner. Events of 2021, and I don't refer to COVID, I refer to other events, have given me confidence that this is possible. We've been discussing for many years whether the traditional financial reports should include more non-financial information. One term used is extended external reporting. Another term is ESG reporting, referring to environment, social and governance reporting. And, and the more recently widely used term is sustainability reporting. I may interchange these terms. Such reporting has been voluntarily adopted for many, many years. KPMG, in its 11th edition of its Survey of Sustainability Reporting Globally, 
then the first one was published in 1993, surveyed 5,200 companies worldwide and found that 80% report on sustainability. Of course, the detail and the nature of the disclosures vary widely. A PwC report, ESG reporting in Australia, reviewed ASX 200 companies and found that 87% of pub published accounts, in, sorry, 87% of companies published substantive level ESG information, up from 58% in 2020. So the debate has been going on for many years and there have been many organisations and frameworks. Let me just explain a couple. The Global Reporting Initiative, established in 1997. The Carbon Disclosure Project, established in 2000. The Climate Disclosure Standards Board, established in 2007. The International Integrated Reporting Council, formed in 2010. So the Sustainability Accounting Standards Board, established in 2011, and the Task Force for Cl on Climate-Related Financial Disclosures, established in 2015. So what is it in 2021 that happened that gave me some confidence? Well, there was a move towards harmonisation of these organisations. In June 2021, the International Integrated Reporting Council and the Sustainability Accounting Standards Board merged into the Value Reporting Foundation. Then, in November 2021, the Value Reporting Foundation and the Climate Disclosure Standards Board announced their intention to consolidate with the IFRS Foundation by 2022. Moreover, in November 2021, the IFRS Foundation announced the formation of the International Sustainability Standards Board. Now, this particular announcement was made at COP26, the United Nations Climate Change Conference held, recently held in Glasgow. So we now have two boards under the governance of the IFRS Foundation. We have the International Accounting Standards Board and the International Sustainability Standards Board. Now, I know that's been a lot of organisations, but it is important to understand the background. Even further, the IFRS Foundation formed a technical readiness working group, which produced two prototype standards, one for general requirements for disclosure of sustainability-related financial information and one for climate-related disclosures. Now, without going into too much detail, the climate-related disclosure prototype covers information that allows users to assess climate-related risks and opportunities with respect to a company's governance, strategy and risk management, as well as metrics and targets. It also includes industry-specific disclosure requirements for 12 different industries. So the new board, which only at this stage has a chair and a vice chair, applications for members are being considered as we speak, is already, that already has two significant prototype standards to begin work with. The IFRS Foundation allows for the chair, sorry, the IFRS Foundation constitution allows for the chair and the vice chair to expose standards for comment without a full contingent of ISSB members. This, so we're expecting to see an exposure draft early in 2022. This is indeed lightning pace in standard setting terms. I must mention Europe, another major player in, the, in, this, in this area. In April 2021, the European Commission adopted a proposal for a corporate sustainability reporting directive, which envisages the adoption of EU sustainability reporting standards to be drafted by the European Financial Reporting Advisory Group. And in September 2021, EFRAG made publicly available their climate standard prototype working paper with the first set of standards expected to be issued by September 2022. Closer to home, in New Zealand, the New Zealand Financial Sector Amendments Bill passed in October 2021 allows for the XRB to produce climate-related climate disclosure standard, a climate disclosure standard. A formal exposure draft is expected to be published in 2022 with a final standard expected by the end of 2022. At, at this point, I must explain the definition of what I mean by 
ESG and sustainability a little bit more. The ISSB is starting with climate-related disclosures, but the end game could be much, much wider. It could include Indigenous and human rights, modern slavery, biodiversity, data management and privacy, labour relations, occupational health and safety, security practices, anti-corruption, diversity and equal opportunity. In fact, I prefer to say all matters environmental, social and governance related. We should not, I should make it clear too at this stage, to do not necessarily ex exclude these from their, their impact on financial information. I'm pleased, pleased to say that in December 2018, the Australian Accounting Standards Board and the Auditing and Assurance Standards Board issued non-mandatory guidance, which, which was to give guidance on how to assess materiality in relation to the preparation of an entity's financial statements and consider other risks. Now, specifically, climate-related disclosures is an issue of some huge public policy, and it's, it's unusual for a public policy topic like this to be key and centre of a standard-setting board's agenda. So what does this mean for Australia? There is no national approach to sustainability reporting in Australia. There is some legislation whereby organisations choose from the various frameworks that exist globally. Examples include the National Greenhouse and Energy Reporting Act 2007, the Water Act 2007, the Modern Slavery Act 2018, and the Workplace Gender Equality Act 2015. But because they choose different frameworks to, dis to disclose, the issue here is that they are not consistent and they're not comparable. And that's a very key point as to why we need a framework that is, that is agreed by the various parties. This has led, the, the voluntary disclosure has led to greenwashing, which refers to the marketing spin about how environmentally friendly a corporate or its product is. So in November 2021, the FRC, the AASB and the AUASB issued a position statement that the boards will seek to adopt global developments within the current institutional framework for financial reporting. The AASB will develop reporting requirements, the AUASB will develop the assurance requirements, and the FRC will continue to provide strategic oversight of the boards. Accordingly, the boards do not support, at this time, establishing a new body that would, that would, be, that would specialise in developing sustainability reporting requirements. The boards will maintain their close links with the IFRS Foundation and the development of the ISSB to ensure that Australia's interests are appropriately represented. In, indeed, that includes supporting applicants to be members of the ISSB. I'm pleased to be able to say that Sue Lloyd has been avoid, appointed Vice Chair of the ISSB, Sue being from New Zealand. Further to this, in November 2021, the AASB released an invitation to comment, seeking views on whether to support voluntary adoption of the recommendations of the Task Force on Climate Financial Disclosures, which is the basis on which the ISSB will produce its standards. But this was with reference to climate-related disclosures only. It was not meant to be re referring to sustainability wide disclosures. It is just an interim position. It is certainly not the final position because there is much to do. So I think this is a significant event of some moment. I'd compare it with the way that the international, the Australian financial reporting framework was when the changes it went through in, in early 2000s. In 2001, the IFRS Foundation was formed and the International Accounting Standards Board was established. And in 2005, Australia chose to adopt IFRA standards as a basis for Australian standards. And in 2006, Australia chose the international standards on auditing as a basis for Australian auditing standards. So we became an adopter of international standards. 
during this time. Some individuals who, who were participated in those developments were admitted, have been, since been admitted to the Australian Accounting Hall of Fame for their efforts, as, as, among other things. So what is it that excites me? Let me explore some of the opportunities. Uh, in, in so doing, though, let's also remember there will be challenges. Firstly, all players in the financial reporting ecosystem. There's much written and said that some of the problems of our current financial reporting system require action from all parties in what's referred to as the financial reporting ecosystem. Preparers, users, investors, standard setters, regulators, academics, directors, and audit committees. And I'm presuming there's a representation of these, of these players in tonight's audience. There will be a need to lift the skills of each of those players. And, but similarly, there may be new players which will be introduced to have specialist skills. They may be brought in to bring the, re the reporting to life. For example, various sciences, human relations, agriculture, law, or risk management. An interesting development in this particular space is, is the diversity of stakeholders being appointed to various boards. The call for applications to the ISSB board, ISSB, sorry, asks for experts with experience in sustainability and its reporting, including preparers, investors, standard setters, regulators, auditors, specialists in environmental and other sustainability matters, and academics. There's a similar approach to the, in the proposals for future members of the International Board that sets auditing standards and the International Board that sets ethics standards being promoted for the future as being multi-stakeholder boards with experience in the preparation, audit, oversight, delivery and use of financial statements and with the ability to analyse if the work of the boards is responsive to the public interest. Complexity. Annual reports are currently very complex and some can be 200 pages. I think they're losing some of their position as the key document to support investment. Indeed, it's not the only document that investor, investors use to make their decisions. Indeed, some, many companies produce several reports for various uses. Indeed, the, currently, the sustainability, sustainability reports are often a separate report. Many will argue that the ideal solution is, for, is to integrate all such reporting into one report. But to do so may, may mean reducing some of the financial disclosures or, alternatively, reconsidering its accessibility. Many companies have tried to make their reports simpler and more user-friendly, but with the, with the in, increase in type of information to be presented, the challenges will, in, will, get, will, get, will get greater. And please don't underestimate the complexity of, of measuring and disclosing the new matters pertaining to sustainability. Now, systems and processes is an area I'm particularly keen on. Disclosures in annual reports are generally underpinned by systems and processes that drive behaviour within the entity. If, if corporate activity with respect to environment, social and, co and governance matters are systemised, there's a greater likelihood that change behaviour will occur and be sustained. This, this is fundamental. It means that corporate Australia can address issues that have been so difficult for governments and the community to sort out. This is a chance for corporate Australia to try and make a difference with respect to values other than financial gain. And I think this is going to be particularly enticing to new recruits to the profession. I've spoken about disclosures, but for that disclosure to have credibility, it's, it's wise to have assurance provided on it. Currently, audits of financial reports are provided by practitioners who are generally members of the accounting bodies, with registered company auditors being the designation required by corporations law. Such members are required to comply with a code of ethics promulgated by the Accounting Professional and Ethical Standards Board. These principles establish the standard of behaviour expected of a member. The fundamental principles are integrity, objectivity, professional competence and due care, confidentiality and professional behaviour. 
Independent standards are a key element of the code. At this stage, the assurance of sustainability reporting, in particular, should it be provided by way of a separate report, is not necessarily carried out by members of the accounting profession. Other, pr other practitioners with specialist skills can provide the assurance, and such practitioners therefore may not be currently subject to the code of ethics I've just mentioned. This is a threat and an opportunity to the accounting bodies to position members as the prescribed assurers, either by supporting regulation or by simply positioning the reputation of the members of the profession. The size of the market for assurance services will grow significantly. And again, this provides an opportunity for the accounting bodies and to members such as audit firms. It also provides an opportunity for compet from competition from new providers. And to use audit firms as an example, I'll, I'll be interested to see how the skills of assurance practitioners develop over time to the degree to which the assurance practitioner has a, a broader range of skills or the, or the degree to which specialists are used. For example, currently we use forensic specialists to help with the audit of fraud and we use insolvency specialists to help with the issues around going concern. But I would think generally the, the, the skill set of assurance practitioners will broaden. Let me, let me move to universities and let me talk about research and education together. Undergraduate courses will need to reflect broader reporting, including underlying systems, and accounting firms will also recruit from various university disciplines, as indeed they, they, do, they do now. More urgently, though, is the need for research to help the, the, develop the content of standards and improvements over time. Metrics and targets are an immediate area for research of best practices. Similarly, the impact of disclosures of, on behaviours in financial terms on the cost of capital, but in non-financial terms on the various objectives of the disclosures. Key issues that will be the subject of significant debate will be the definition of materiality of information to be disclosed, the, the definition of the users to whom the information is directed, and the integration of financial and non-financial information. I would like to compliment academia on their performance with, with respect to the recent parliamentary joint committee inquiry into the regulation of auditing. There were numerous submissions from academics and many academics presented personally before the committee. I believe that there was a time where academia stood up and, and made their views heard, and I would encourage them to do it again, so that I would encourage you to provide submissions now to these standard setting bodies to help with, with the future developments. Have I forgotten anything? Yes, I've forgotten a lot because there's a lot to cover. The public sector will need to address these, these opportunities also. Smaller and medium size entities, I think, may not be a, 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 a point of first attention, but will in the future be subject to the same challenges. And audit quality, which is already subject to some challenges, will be further challenged as the, as the disclosures broaden. Coordination. How do we coordinate this? I've, I've expressed the need for compromise so that we can achieve the agreed successes. Let me provide an example of the failure to see the need for consistency. In 2015, the University of Adelaide, supported by Chartered Accountants Australia and New Zealand, examined 844 pieces of Commonwealth and state legislation pertaining to financial information and found confusion among the definition of the information to be prepared, the scope of the assurance work to be performed and the qualifications of the assurance provider. Just not helpful to preparers or assurers alike. And also, let's look at the history of other harmonisation efforts. Not all of them succeed. US GAAP and IFRS harmonisation continues to be a challenge too great to achieve. And restructure of the international audit standard setting and the international ethical standard setting was subject to consultation some five years ago and is still in progress. And a last comment on inconsistency. The ISSB is being formed in a relatively short time frame 
and will consist of full-timer members who are paid at market rates. Indeed, 500,000 UK pound would be the remuneration for a member. This, this is well-funded. But the IAASB that sets auditing standards internationally and the IESBA, which sets the ethical requirements internationally, continue to rely on part-time voluntary members. Despite a report by the monitoring group, the governing body of those boards, four years ago that this issue should be addressed. No solution seems near. So in conclusion, I've given you a coverage tonight of recent international and Australian developments with respect to sustainability reporting. As I, I believe these opportunities could reinvigorate the profession, but I repeat that I said they may do so because it will require compromise and action on a timely basis. I urge as many of you as possible in the audience tonight to take part in these opportunities. Thank you. Thank you, Bill, for your insightful and thought-provoking address to us this evening. I turn now to the formal part of the evening, introduction of the 2022 Australian Accounting Hall of Fame inductees and citation readers. The Australian Accounting Hall of Fame calls Chesley Anthony Baragwanath. The citation for Chesley Baragwanath will be read by Mr Joseph Manders. Chesley Anthony Baragwanath, known as Ches, qualified for membership of the Australian Society of Accountants in 1964, studying with the Hemingway Robertson Institute. He started his working life in the audit field with the Australian Audit Office, now the Australian National Audit Office, in 1952 and subsequently moved to the State Electricity Commission of Victoria as Internal Audit Manager before transferring back to the Australian Audit Office as Assistant Auditor General. Ches Baragwanath was appointed the 23rd Victorian Auditor General in 1988. During his 11-year tenure, Ches Baragwanath redefined public accountability in Victoria. In doing so, he set new standards for the work of the Parliament of Victoria's key watchdogs and established benchmarks for upholding the right of the community to be fully informed on how elected officials managed their taxes. A key characteristic of the work of Ches Baragwanath was the resolve he displayed in preserving the public interest in several complex and challenging encounters with governments. His searching reports to Parliament encompassed a range of topics across the breadth of the public sector. Many of these reports attracted wide and high profile community support, involving audits with a high degree of complexity, often accentuated by controversial status. Ches was fearless in his commitment to reinforcing the community's right to know and always ensured his reports were based on unassailable audit evidence. Ches Baragwanath displayed a tenacity to withstand the pressures placed on him and his tireless commitment to serving the parliament and through parliament, the Victorian community. He did this with great dignity and fairness. His various audit recommendations became the impetus for enhancing the efficiency and effectiveness of the operations of government entities. As Auditor General of Victoria, Ches Baragwanath was the driving force behind constitutional provisions introduced by the Victorian Parliament in 1999, which assigned the strongest possible level of independence to the position. Further constitutional provisions enacted in 2003 ensured this independence was permanently protected from external influence. Through these amendments, the Victorian Auditor General today operates with total independence, essentially distanced 
from the direct influence of executive government. Ches Baraguana served the Australian accounting profession in a number of areas. He was a fellow of CPA Australia, Victorian State President, and inaugural chair of the Audit Centre of Excellence. He was a member of the Commonwealth Electoral Redistribution Committee and for some years, honorary treasurer of the Australian Red Cross. In 2010, he was appointed for a period as a sessional commissioner of the Victorian Commission for Gambling Regulation. In June 2003, Ches Baraguanic was made an officer of the Order of Australia for service to the community in the area of public accountability and financial management and in the development of standards through initiatives such as privatisation and advances in information technology. The Australian Accounting Hall of Fame honours Chesley Baraguanov as accountant, auditor and public servant. I now invite Mrs Jan Baraguanov to make a response on behalf of Ches Baraguanov. Good evening everyone. On behalf of Chairs, I would like to thank the University of Melbourne for hosting the accounting, Australian Accounting Hall of Fame, Joe Manders of the Audit Office of Victoria for his contribution to the citation and for nominating him for induction into the Hall of Fame and of course for the Hall of Fame for accepting the nomination in recognition of Ches's contribution and achievements in the accounting profession. As the citation has covered the accounting aspects of Ches's career, I thought I would provide some personal insight into his progress from junior clerk in the Australian National Audit Office in Melbourne to Auditor General of Victoria, a rather peripatetic journey. From the start, he considered that the role of auditor was to serve in the public interest and to ensure the general public was provided with information on government spending and expenses. Three particular roles in his career contrib contributed to the development of his accounting skills and experience, as well as his people management and leadership skills. He considered these roles to be instrumental in his development and beneficial in leading to his appointment as Auditor General of Victoria. In 1969, with a desire to gain experience in one of the three audit office branches overseas, London, New York and Papua New, New Guinea, he applied for the London position but was unsuccessful. New York was next on the list and as he was the only applicant because nobody else wanted to live there, he was appointed to the position. At the time, New York had problems with race rights and street fueled drug crimes and people were reluctant, of course, to be based there, but we were happy to go. Over four years at both the consulate in New York and the embassy in Washington, he audited Australian government contracts with the US Defence Department, which included the very expensive project of the F-111 fighters. His discovery of a $1 million overcharge by the contractor, a lot of money in 1970, was a defining moment for his career. In 1975, a year after returning from New York, Chess was appointed as Chief Auditor of the Northern Territory in the aftermath of Cyclone Tracy, which had quite literally blown the office away and scattered papers all over the place. Over two eventful years, the office was reinstated and functioning as required. He also worked with the D Darwin Reconstruction Commission in the rebuilding process and joined Red Cross working on disposition of cyclone donations and the Rotary Club working on a range of projects to restore Darwin, his favourite a project, this one, including the replanting of the foreshore gardens, which look amazing now, much to his delight. He has seen them. In 1984, he left the ANAO for the position of Chief Inter Internal Auditor of the State Electricity Commission of Victoria, SECV. This was the most enjoyable role of his career due to the clarity of the internal audit functions and charter and their well-developed process processes and forward thinking. When approached to apply from that position for the position of Victorian Auditor General, 
his experience in the SECV internal audit team with its thorough approach ensured that he would bring the same approach to the new role. In August 1988, he was appointed as Auditor General of Victoria, a position he held until retirement in 1999. He considered this, to be, this, condition, this position to be the pinnacle of his career and enjoyed mostly, and I say mostly for all of us, the political interaction throughout his 11 years in office. Chess would wish to thank me and our daughters, Kristen and Marlow, for our love and support. More importantly, he would extend his gratitude to the many people who provided their loyalty, work ethic and support of his leadership in all of the various organisations in which he worked, but particularly his staff in the Office of Auditor General of Victoria. Going through two different um, sides of government, Labor appointed him and then Jeff Kennett got into power. Those years were a pretty wild ride and he always acknowledged that as a leader, he was nothing without his excellent staff. Thank you. Thank you, Joseph and Jan, and congratulations to the late Ches Baragwanov. The Australian Accounting Hall of Fame calls Patricia Mary de Chow. The citation for Patricia de Chow will be read by Neil Farger. Patricia M. Deschau has played an important role in research investigating the quality of reported earnings, firm valuation, and misstatements of financial statements, thereby providing an important interface between accounting academia and accounting in practice. Patricia Deschau was educated in Perth, where she earned a first-class honours degree in commerce from the University of Western Australia in 1986. She subsequently pursued graduate studies in the United States completing an MS and PhD at the University of Rochester in 1993. Patricia is presently the Robert R. Doxon Professor of Business Administration and Professor of Accounting at the University of Southern California, having previously held appointments at the University of California, Berkeley, the University of Michigan and the University of Pennsylvania. She also holds a position as a Research Fellow at the Center for Financial Reporting and Accountability at the Judge School of Business, Cambridge University. Prior to her academic appointments, Patricia worked at PricewaterhouseCoopers in Perth and at the University of Western Australia. Patricia's highly acclaimed research has focused on accounting accruals, the quality and reliability of earnings, the use of earnings information in predicting stock returns, and the effect of analyst forecasts on investors' perceptions of firm value. She has also developed measures that evaluate the likelihood of financial statement manipulation. Patricia was first published in the Australian Journal of Management in 1987, and her subsequent publication record includes over 30 articles in The Accounting Review, Journal of Accounting and Economics, Journal of Accounting Research, Journal of Financial Economics, and the Review of Accounting Studies, together with publications for the Chartered Financial Analyst Institute. Patricia Deschau was awarded the American Accounting Association's seminal Contribution to Accounting Literature Award in 2019 and the Award of Distinguished Contribution to Accounting Literature Award in 2010 and 2015. Professor Deschau is presently Managing Editor of the Review of Accounting Studies and has previously held the role of Editor at the Accounting Review, Accounting Horizons and Management Science. With teaching interests in financial accounting and reporting, Patricia has a distinguished record of engagement with undergraduate, graduate and doctoral students and executive education. She has supervised over 30 doctoral students, many of whom have gone on to successful careers in academia and industry. Patricia was awarded the American Accounting Association's Financial Accounting Research Section Distinguished PhD Mentoring Award in 2020. Patricia has also participated as a faculty member in the Accounting and Finance Association of Australia and New Zealand Doctoral Colloquium and has also served on the Editorial Board of Accounting and Finance. Patricia chaired the Research Relevance Task Force for the American Accounting Association 2017-18, which reported on steps to improve the relevance of research. Patricia has served on numerous committees at the American Accounting Association and is currently a member of the Board of Responsible Research in Business and Management. 
a global network of academics from all business disciplines that have the common objective of enhancing the relevance of business research that addresses pressing issues facing society today. The Australian Accounting Hall of Fame honours Patricia Deschau as a thinker, eminent scholar and teacher. I now invite Patricia to make a response. I'm very honoured to receive the Australian Accounting Hall of Fame Award. And a big thank you goes to Neil Farger for nominating me for this award. I really appreciate it. Uh, during an academic career, there are many people that help you along the way. And I'd just like to mention a few of those people. I did my undergraduate at University of West Australia, and I guess the first source of inspiration were the professors there. I, I was very fortunate to have Philip Brown teach me um, security analysis, and I just thought that was the greatest course. It was known for being a tough course, but I just kind of loved it. Uh, so thank you very much, Philip. He was also my honours supervisor. I, Zan, Brian Housen and Peter Kirby were also very influential on me. They were very supportive and we discussed so much research. So thank, a big thank you goes out to them. And these people also helped me realise that I could go to, the, to go, go to the US and do a PhD. And that was uh, very important. Um, I did my PhD at University of Rochester. And if you know where that is on a map, it's uh, in the East Coast, North, very cold and snowy. And it was kind of tough coming from Perth, going to such a snowy, cold place. But there was a couple of professors there that really um, helped me along. And the first one was Ross Watts, who was my dissertation supervisor, and also Ray Ball, who uh, is also in the Australian Accounting Hall of Fame. Uh, these professors were really good to me because they invited me over to their houses they, uh, I got to know their families and generally they were really um, supportive. So thank you to both of them. If you uh, see uh, my career or follow my career, you'll see that I started off on the East Coast and then I slowly headed West. So my first job was at the Wharton School of Business. Then I went to University of Michigan, then to UC Berkeley and now finally at uh, Marshall School of Business at University of Southern California. So the uh, weather got warmer as I moved across America. But I think also the other great thing about uh, changing universities was just that I met so many and had so many different colleagues. And a big thank you goes out to all of them for um, challenging me as well as supporting me through my career. Another factor I think that's always helpful or has been very helpful to me is uh, PhD students. I've mentored a lot of PhD students and their hard work and enthusiasm for accounting has really got me uh, so many more publications than I would have had otherwise. So a big thank you to those PhD students. And uh, finally, I'd like to thank my family. Um, first, Richard Sloan. He's my husband, co-author and colleague. Uh, we met at University of West Australia in the library, which I've always think is kind of funny. And, um, you know, he did a PhD also at University of Rochester, and he's a big force in accounting, and he's always kept me inspired as well as supported me. So thank you, Richard. Uh, my father was also very important to me. He was a geologist and uh, was uh, looking at minerals during the nickel boom and uh, gold booms in West Australia, and he never believed in efficient markets. And going to Rochester, which was a very efficient market type school, uh, and having him as a contrast, saying, no, no, they're not efficient, uh, was really great for me, really helped me think outside the box. So thank you to my dad. And finally, I'd just like to uh, thank my children, uh, Stephen and Emma. Uh, as you probably know, children keep you humble, but they also are a good source of inspiration and seeing the world in a different light. So thank you to both of them. And with that, I'll close. Thank you. Thank you, Neil. And congratulations, Patricia. That brings us to the end of the formalities. Congratulations to the late Ches Baragwanath and to Patricia De Chow as the 2022 members of the Australian Accounting Hall of Fame. Thank you to Bill Edge for his informative address. 
Thank you again to CPI Australia and Chartered Accountants Australia and New Zealand for their continued support of the work of the Australian Accounting Hall of Fame. Thank you to the members of the nominations review panel for the effort taken to assess the nominations received. Thank you to the nominators without whose efforts this evening would not transpire. And thank you to all of the friends of the Australian Accounting Hall of Fame for your attendance this evening. We look forward to your continued support, hopefully with a return to a live presentation and dinner in 2023. I now invite Brad to formally close the evening. Thank you, Phil. We have three announcements before the final close. Firstly, nominations for the 2023 intake open on the 1st of August 2022. Second, this video will remain available on YouTube and on our website for anyone who was not able to view it live or if you'd like to view it again. And finally, the commemorative booklet with full details of the 2022 Australian Accounting Hall of Fame is available for download from the Australian Accounting Hall of Fame website. Please see the link in this video description for access. I now formally draw the evening to a close and wish you all good night. Take care.